you. Good evening, Malaysia. We are now at a critical juncture of a major tropic cascade whose impacts and consequences, especially for the developing tropical countries, will be devastating. And these are made worse by corrupt governments that are endlessly raping, pillaging, and plundering their own biodiversity and natural assets. If this conference wishes to realize its goal on the contributions of science and technology to achieve sustainability, then it first needs to acknowledge that poor governance is the most critical challenge it must overcome. There is no shying away from this fact that no more niceties, no more lip service, and no more denials. We cannot proceed business as usual. We have already failed to meet any IHE biodiversity targets and we are on the road to failing our commitments to the SDGs. Next slide, please. I would like to start my talk by briefly drawing our attention to the global crisis that seemed to have taken a back seat due to the prolonged pandemic. We are currently at the tipping point of the sixth mass extinction, driven by human-induced and human-exacerbated global crisis. The ongoing pandemic cannot be seen in isolation from this crisis. They are closely intertwined. In fact, the impacts and the consequences of the pandemic are giving us a glimpse into what the future holds for us once we cross the tipping point. Next slide, please. I'm sure many of us are quite familiar with this illustration, the triple bottom line. The triple bottom line is a framework that recommends that companies pay attention to the social and environmental concerns, not just their profits. However, I find this illustration somewhat misleading. It tends to imply two things. Firstly, people, planet, and profit are independent entities that can be brought together to achieve sustainability. Secondly, the illustration shows that profits can exist without people and the planet. Hence, we need to be very careful when using this illustration. The context must be clearly explained. Otherwise, we are inadvertently conveying the wrong message, a message that can influence poor decision makings, a message that will leave most of us in a slumber of inactions or come up with actions that are seemingly adorable but do not address the real issues such as the scheme to plant 10 million trees in 10 countries in 10 years. This scheme will not match the rate of ongoing destruction. Moreover, it will take decades before the planted trees start providing services to offset the damages we have done. By then, it might be too late. I'm not saying we should not be planting trees. I'm saying that we should prioritize the protection of what we already possess and arrest any further destruction of ecosystem and loss of biodiversity. Next slide, please. Maybe this is a better illustration. Although not as sexy as the earlier one, yet we can visibly see that profit is only a tiny fraction of this greater picture and that profit depends on the social capital and that both profit and the well-being of people are dependent on a healthy, thriving planet. I'm not just talking about an illustration. I'm also implying the mindset. Next slide, please. Now, let's take a look at what I mean by the mindset. As I mentioned earlier, because we measure development in terms of economic development, therefore, we operate as if profit is the foundation of everything else. So with this mindset, you can see how dangerously unstable our practices are. Why the ongoing mindset and practices, you may ask? Before I describe why, Let's first look at the desired mindset and practices if we wish to see any semblance of sustainability. Next slide, please. This should be our desired mindset and practices. This illustration clearly shows that profit is entirely dependent on healthy people and a healthy planet. Similarly, you can have the desired social capital only when you have a planet that is not failing. Next slide, please. Now, let's get back to why we have this disgracefully poor mindset and practices. We have to accept the facts. Not only do we have incompetent leaders, not only do we have selfish and greedy leaders who have institutionalized self-imposed colonization, who have weaponized race and religion, who hide behind oppressive laws and silence those advocating social and environmental justice, but we also have leaders who lack 
common sense. You may not agree with me, but common sense dictates that we do not do things that hurt ourselves, even if we don't care about others. These leaders are hurting both the social and environmental capitals that are benefiting them. To me, that doesn't make sense. But the leaders are not the only ones to be blamed. A large portion of the human population is ignorant, either by design or due to the systemic downgrading of education. Those who have common sense but choose to remain silent are also to blame. There is one particular group of people that is simply an embarrassment. They comprise scientists, academicians, and people endowed with the intellectual capacity and position to influence policies and decisions. Yet, they choose to be silent about the underlying issues. Shame on them. In fact, shame on all of us. We say we care for biodiversity, yet we can't even respect human diversity, be it the variation in our genetic makeup or cultural diversity or even gender diversity. So how can we be expected to achieve sustainability? To move on, do note that I'm using the word assets instead of resources. Resources imply that they are there for the taking, be it to gain wealth or simply to sustain oneself. So the more one takes, the wealthier or better off one becomes, right? Well, biodiversity and nature is the goose that lay the golden eggs. Therefore, treating biodiversity and nature as resources is like cutting up the golden goose to extract all the eggs in one go. Next slide, please. Governance, legislation, policies, education, economies, planning, development, all should be designed and implemented with the planet first. Governance has to be based on responsible actions. Significantly, this also means revamping the current form of governance. In fact, besides the biodiversity and climate crisis, we are also facing a governance crisis. Governance must be based on sound science, transparency, accountability, compassion, among others. Good governance in the case of Malaysia also means having lesser but more cohesive ministries. For example, instead of having two disjointed, non-complementary ministries, we should be having one, say, a Ministry of Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And this should be the key ministry to screen development plans before any other ministry approves them. In addition, we need to treat any act that causes major harm to the environment as an environmental crime because it is an act against humanity. Moreover, one reason why we are nowhere near using our assets sustainably is because we treat sustainability as a set of activities rather than a, rather than a conceptualized goal. We first need to put responsible actions into place before we can realize our sustainability goals. I want to end my talk by highlighting that we are currently in a situation where Quick actions are critical, and the consequences of failure will spell doom for humanity. Thank you. Thank you.